Thank you very much. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here and tell you about uh, what we've been up to uh, during the pandemic. So um, I'm gonna tell you today about uh, the tools we provide to help um, really everyone in the community turbocharge the capabilities of quantum computing. So just to tell you a bit about myself, um, so uh, my name is Joseph Emerson. I uh, have been working in the quantum computing field for about two decades. I was involved in one of the first uh, quantum computing experiments with three qubits uh, 20 years ago at MIT. And uh, since then, I've been working on ways to understand and reduce the impact of errors on quantum computing processors, or quantum processors. About five years ago, I was having dinner with Jay Gambetta, who was my postdoc uh, about a decade ago, and he went to IBM and told me about that, that they were launching a quantum computer on the cloud. And, uh, and that immediately got me thinking that, you know, this is finally happening. We're seeing a quantum industry emerge. And I formed a startup, Quantum Benchmark. And uh, very early on, we got um, some early adopting customers like Google and Lawrence Berkeley Lab and others, and uh, provided to them tools to help understand uh, the errors occurring on their system and how to overcome them. Uh, we also have expanded our uh, user base to end users of quantum computing, so companies looking to leverage this new capability, this new uh, source of, of computing power uh, to run experiments, jobs, applications on cloud, and compu cloud quantum computing platforms. And uh, most recently, earlier this year, we were acquired by Keysight Technologies uh, to join their program to deliver quantum solutions to, to the community. Just to mention a few things about Keysight, many of you know Keysight. It's hard to go into a quantum computing lab and not find a few racks of Keysight hardware equipment. Keysight spun out of Hewlett Packard uh, many years ago um, via Agilent and uh, has, has been developing you know, state-of-the-art cutting edge control electronics to serve uh, various industries, including uh, physics labs that build quantum computers. Um, but it's important to emphasize that uh, Keysight has now embraced, as of about five years ago, a strategy to develop their impact on the quantum computing industry more, more directly. And that involves, in particular, uh, helping with the software stack required to get quantum computers to work efficiently and well. And the acquisition of Quantum Benchmark was part of that. So let me tell you a bit more about what we do and why it's so important. So why is it important? So this is one of my favorite analogies for folks coming from a classical computing background. Quantum computing is a fundamentally different technology, not just in the fact that it can solve these problems that classical con computing, conventional computing can't solve, but the nature of the technology itself is, is really you know, apples to oranges with respect to conventional computing. So my analogy for this is to think about conventional high performance computing as a high speed train. So the challenge there, the engineering challenge, is to build faster and faster engines. You don't have to worry about navigation because you're following a track. That train is going to take you from A to B, and there's no doubt about it. And the key thing to improve is the speed. With quantum computing, we're dealing with a new challenge, which is analogous to the challenge of you know, rocket technology or rocket science. So when you have a rocket, you're able to get to places you can never get to with the train. You can go to the moon. You can go to Mars. But you have to be able to navigate in a, in a three-dimensional space. You have to navigate through space. You have to monitor and correct the course of the rocket in order to make sure you arrive at B. And this is the same with quantum computing. The power of quantum computing comes from the fact that we are uh, using analog control to navigate the computation in a high dimensional space. In fact, it's much more than three dimensions. It's an exponentially large space called Hilbert space. The size of that space scales exponentially with the number of qubits in your system. So the very power of quantum computing is a double-edged sword. How do we make sure that we stay on track, on trajectory for that computation? What tools can we provide to do that? And that is a new scientific and engineering challenge. And that is exactly the challenge that my research has been focused on for two decades and that we deliver through our solutions. Let me tell you a little bit more about that. So here's a figure I've been showing for a few years in refining, and it's really meant to convey the nature of the error challenge which is you know, analogous to this navigation challenge with rockets. So on the x-axis is something that you all know, which is counting the number of qubits in the system. 
On the y-axis, we have circuit depth. This is a measure of the complexity of the problem, the number of gates or gate operations required to reach the solution. The bigger the problem, the harder the problem, the larger the complexity or circuit depth, which is the number of sequential operations that need to be applied to arrive at the solution. So it, it, it's doing double duty here, because on the one hand, you can characterize a hardware device in terms of how many gate operations can it execute before you just see noise. And at the same time, we can use it to characterize the hardness of a problem run on that quantum computer, how many gate operations are needed to reach the solution. The diagonal lines that you see coming down to the left are these boundaries set by some very simplistic overview of errors. So often you hear, you hear folks talk about the error rate or the fidelity of the system. That's an oversimplified understanding of the challenge, but let's just stick with it for now just to give a, 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 an overview of where we are and where we need to get. So as you can see, if you have a 100 qubits and 10 to the minus two error rates, that means you have one error per 100 operations, then you can basically do one gate operation before you're likely to get an error somewhere in the processor. If you have one qubit, you can probably go about 100 operations before you're likely to see an error. So that's why the line slopes down like that. The more qubits you have, the harder it is to do a significant depth computation because the errors can occur anywhere spatially across the, the system. What I've drawn in the black line here is the only thing I'm showing you that's artist's interpretation. So this is just a heuristic boundary, this solid black line, of the minimum capabilities of a quantum computer that it would be required to start hoping for quantum advantage. So crossing that boundary doesn't mean you've reached quantum advantage, it means you're in a position to potentially find, to potentially reach quantum advantage if you have the right, right problem, the right processor, and, and so on, and the, you know, that problem is hard classically. And in green, I've shown what is kind of the so-called NISC regime, which is the ex exploratory regime where we're hoping to find quantum advantage through more or less trial and error. In, in pink or red, I'm showing the regime we have to reach where we're very likely to reach quantum advantage, where we're entering into a regime where we know that a quantum processor that can reach those design specs would be able to solve interesting problems in science and in industry. What I want to draw your attention to is that the best case hardware qubits, what you're going to access if you access a quantum computer through the cloud, in this near term, next generation set of processors like we've heard about today, is really in this gray area. And as you can see, there's a disconnect between where the, what the hardware is going to deliver to you and where you have to be to find value. And this isn't bad news, this is good news because there are methods to go up and to the right and to reach these regimes of advantage. And the key point here is that is a software layer that will achieve that. Various capabilities around error suppression, error mitigation, eventually error correction. Error correction involves us going far off to the right and having many, many more physical qubits that are then translated into logical qubits. And so that's, that subtlety is, is not expressed in this figure but it's heuristically represented by the fact that efficient error correction codes, efficient decoders will translate to lower overheads and more logical qubits. So in that case, you imagine the number of qubits here represents the logical qubits. Up and to the right in that pink regime is exactly where you have logical qubits achieving very high capability, very large circuit depths. And I understand that for industry players entering into this field, exploring quantum computing, I understand that many of you know that quantum computing is not delivering advantage right now. That for many of you, it's about learning the know-how of how to leverage quantum computing, how to understand the time scale quantum computing will impact your industry, your problems of interest, and building up expertise within your organization to be positioned to leverage those capabilities as it develops. And what I want to emphasize is that if your team is learning how to write circuits and run them on hardware, you're missing the most important part of the problem, which is figuring out how to navigate that rocket ship so that you end up on Mars and not somewhere stuck between Saturn and Jupiter. So that's the most important thing. How do you assess that you're following the right computation? Quantum computers are interesting when they can solve problems that we can't solve classically. 
That means we can't verify that the solution is correct with a classical computer, except in a special case of problems that are so-called NP problems. But for many cases of interest, material science, quantum chemistry, we don't know what the binding energy is between a protein and a ligand. We want to use a quantum computer to discover that. If the quantum computer computes incorrectly because errors have affected the computation, it, the quantum computer will give you an answer and it will be the wrong answer. So what is the business cost of deploying these resources and getting an incorrect solution which you don't know is incorrect? So that's part of the solution we provide to help you understand how errors are impacting the computation, how far you can minimize them and provide quality assurance and performance guarantees that the computation is indeed within some threshold of tolerance to the, the correct solution. So one more analogy before I get to some uh, user success stories. So when we had talked about that diagonal line where we think about one error rate, one fidelity number, 99.9 .9 or 10 to the minus three as a characterization of the error, that is a massive oversimplification of the errors that we see today and the errors we will see in 10 and 20 years. There is a vast complexity to the errors that can occur in a quantum computation. Imagine your rocket ship trying to characterize how far off course you are by one number. Well, in what direction, right? Now in quantum computing, there's an exponential number of directions you can be off course. And so you need tools to leverage that. And this is what's happening beneath the iceberg here. So here, I apologize for changing analogies from rocket ships to, <laughs> to boats, but the concept is there that we need tools to navigate and overcome errors, not just the errors we can see easily, but the errors that are affecting the computation beneath the surface, and that's exactly what we do. Our solutions work across platforms, um, superducting qubit systems, trapped ion systems, spin qubit systems, photonic systems, as, as developed by various uh, companies today, our solutions work across all of these platforms, and they work across all applications. So whether you're interested in applications in material science, drug design, logistics, finance, these are all application areas where our tools can help. So as a kind of a summary of that, we position our technology as a, a layer between the end user application and the hardware platform tools that allow us to understand the circuit that needs to be run, understand how to run it on that hardware, understand how well the hardware ran it, adaptively adjust the, the implementation to improve the performance of the hardware, and then ultimately deliver better performance and better outcomes back to the end user. In summary, our tools provide several different capabilities. So on the one hand, error diagnostics, so these are tools that are heavily used by our current customers who are hardware developers who need to understand what's going wrong with their pulse design, with their crosstalk and so on, extensive diagnostics for them to use. We also can leverage that information for error suppression during runtime. So this is of interest to end users and in industry who want to leverage the maximum capability out of each hardware platform. Our tool set also includes the, the tools that many other software companies provide, which is user convenience tools, access to expertise, and so on. Um, for us, that is uh, an important piece, but really our, our differentiator is our ability to offer industry-leading techniques for monitoring and correcting errors. So now enough of kind of the overview, and let me give you, it's really exciting to be back at Q2B two years now later and be able to show customer success stories. So, our early adopters who have deployed our tools in order to achieve better quantum computational capabilities. I won't be able to discuss all of the outcomes we've seen, but these are all in the public domain, published academic papers, uh, and I can flip through a few that I won't cover today. Google, as noted, has been an adopter of our tools. They have a, a couple of papers that have come out leveraging our tools uh, to achieve better capabilities. Um, IBM recently used one of the methods in our technology to stabilize error mitigation, and I'll show you some results from Lawrence Berkeley Lab where we achieved the same thing prior to that. Um, in addition, uh, Rigetti Computing has been successfully leveraging our tools for their own internal milestones and demonstrations, and um, I won't be able to present all of their results, but I'll show one of them in detail. So the three results I will cover are two results from uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab. 
who have used our tools in two different contexts, as well as a result from Rigetti using our tools for this uh, QAOA optimization algorithm. So the first set of results I can show you are results shared with us uh, by Matt Rieger from Rigetti. Thank you, Matt, for sharing these, these results. Uh, they were running this uh, quantum approximate optimization algorithm, QAOA, uh, which is an important tool uh, for optimization. Here are the X and Y axis on these figures are different beta and gamma, gamma parameters of the algorithm. Uh, what's plotted as the heat map is the landscape that it, we are trying to measure through this algorithm, the, the cost function for max cut in this case. So on the left, you see the ideal performance if you had a perfect quantum computer, which does not exist and will never exist. Errors are part of the game in quantum computing, just like navigation is part of the game with uh, you know, rocket science. Um, and then they ran their, their, the algorithm after tuning up their system, and they, they achieved the middle figure, which is the raw output they saw running. And this is what you would see as an end user running your algorithm on their system. And then they applied our tools uh, to suppress errors in this algorithm, and they got the figure on the right, which is a dramatic sharpening of the image uh, with uh, the, 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 the peaks and the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the maxima and minima of the landscape function are much better localized and, uh, and much easier to identify in this context. Another example from, as many of you know, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab has the Advanced Quantum Testbed Program sponsored by the DOE. They're one of two national programs to develop quantum computing as a resource. And they have been an early adopter of our tools and have become power users of them. And we're very appreciative to see them uh, published papers showing the, the benefits they've achieved. So here what they're running is this quantum Fourier transform, which many of you may have heard of, which is a fundamental subroutine for many applications in quantum simulation. And uh, the, the output of the quantum Fourier transform depends on the input state. So what are shown here are two different input states which lead to different probability distributions after application of the quantum Fourier transform. In black is the ideal output. So these are fairly simple input states, so they produce fairly simple output states. In one case, a flat distribution. In another case, a step function distribution. In blue shows the performance of their system after tune-up, before using our software. And you see some pretty dramatic deviations from the ideal performance. So as you can see, this is not very close to what, what you would want to get if you wanted to trust your solution. In orange is RC stands for randomized compiling, which is one of the layers of optimization our compiler provides. It's in fact the first layer and the easiest to use. And randomized compiling then delivers a much more faithful output to the ideal distribution. And so the, the archive reference is provided there. This is a paper that's being published in Physical Review X as we speak. Uh, I should note the note at the bottom, which is, we can quantify the amount of improvement they achieved, and it was 8x. It was 800% better than the performance without our solution. So we're not talking about a few percent advantage. We're talking about dramatic improvements to the performance of the quantum computer, dramatic improvements scaling up from you know, the bare hardware towards where we need to be for quantum advantage. So it's great, two years ago I was telling this audience that these tools are available, we had numerical simulations showing how well they worked, and now we have actual data from actual quantum computing platforms showing how well they're working. One more example from Lawrence Berkeley Lab, they were using this so-called KITE algorithm to explore a materials science problem. This is a simulation problem where you are driving the system to the ground state of some system of interest. This is important, as I mentioned, in materials science, quantum chemistry. It's a, a fundamental algorithm that we expect to use in the NISC era and beyond. Um, what I'm plotting here is an important insight about not just our ability to suppress errors natively, but our ability to enable error mitigation strategies to work more stably and reliably. So error mitigation is the term I use. That the terminology isn't set in stone. Some people say error mitigation to mean a lot of different things. I'm using the term error mitigation to refer specifically to these techniques that came out of IBM and other places about extrapolating to the zero noise limit. So artificially increasing the error 
so that you can extrapolate back to where the performance would have been in the absence of error. You hear the word extrapolation, you, you should be nervous, right? How do I know that extrapolation worked? Well, today in the papers we see in Science and Nature about this, you know the correct answer because you're solving a problem that's such a small instance that we can calculate it classically. So you can trust the extrapolation because you can confirm that the extrapolation worked. In the future, when we're getting value out of quantum computing, we have to be computing solutions that we don't know, problems where we don't know the true solution. We have to trust the solution. So one of the things that our technology does is it stabilizes the error and enforces it to be linear or stochastic, to use the technical term. And that is a, a critical piece because then you now can reliably extrapolate with confidence and with performance guarantees. So here, this is being demonstrated by Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Uh, this is a lot of data. Let me just highlight a subset of it. If you look at the lower figure, the y-axis is the infidelity. That's basically the error rate. How, so small is good. It's the amount of error between the ideal state and the experimental state you achieve through the quantum computer. And the, the x-axis is imaginary time, which is a, a way to, it's the parameter that you improve or increase to converge to the solution. And what we see in, from green to red to purple to orange is the group at Berkeley systematically exploring the use, their, their bare performance in green, adding in an extrapolation method called purification, adding in our compiling tool, and then looking at both under different performance regimes where they apply different amounts of resource to the problem. And you can see the dramatic improvements achieved when using our compiler tool in combination with this error mitigation method, which is a public domain method used by many groups. And just let me highlight that in orange, we get a 10 to the minus three precision on the correct output starting out from 0.5. <laughs> so that's a huge improvement. These are the kind of improvements that are available to the community now through our, our tool set, this tr true Q system. A more advanced use of our software is to develop a heat map of the errors occurring on the system. One of the important things I mentioned at the beginning of the talk was that thinking about a single number is an oversimplification of the error problem. Here what Lawrence Berkeley is doing is plotting on a four qubit subsystem, three different C naughts. One C naught between the two qubits on the left, a C naught between the two qubits at the top, and a C naught on the two qubits at the right. And plotted is, in the heat map is a subset of the data they obtained. And this is where are the errors occurring in the system. And I'm not gonna go through the details of what each label on the y-axis means, but it's basically all these different directions in Hilbert space where the errors can occur. And it's showing the amount of error occurring in each of those directions. And notice how not only is that one number, it's a spectrum of numbers for each gate, but it varies from gate to gate. And so our tool set and our compiler can leverage this information in order to compensate for the errors in real time, in runtime, when running a circuit of interest. And the reference for that paper is provided on the slide. And using this method, as reported in that paper, uh, Berkeley achieved a 400% improvement in performance. So we were super jazzed up about seeing that result, uh, along with the other results. And we're very excited to, to make these tools available to all of you. Um, there's a couple of customer testimonials here. Obviously, you're not gonna read this. It's too small of a font. But just to emphasize with the data you've seen, uh, the, some of our customers like Google Quantum AI, Alpine Quantum Technologies, which is an IonTrap group in Austria, IonTrap company, I should say. Um, these are testimonies, testimonies from these customers. The point I wanna emphasize is that these are tools being used by the best people in the world in quantum computing. <laughs> so we're excited about that because it shows you, know, you should be using the tools that the industry leaders are using. And so that's you know, part of the story I wanted to get across today. So we have a large contingent here at, at, uh, at Q2B, uh, the Keysight group, uh, the Quantum Solutions group. Uh, this is a snapshot of our webpage uh, where you can find more information about us and our solutions ranging from hardware to software. Um, we have, a, as I mentioned, a large contingent here. Here are some of the, the smiling faces you can meet up with. Over in the, um, in the reception area at the booths, we have a booth set up, a Keysight booth, and 
We'll all be around here uh, for the rest of the week and later today if you want to come talk to us and learn more about our solutions. So with that, I will end and thank you for your attention. We do have time for a question, if there's a question from the audience. Do I see one over here? We do have a microphone. You were showing results of the improvement factor with, uh, with Berkeley. How does your ability to mitigate errors scale with the number of qubits? as you have more or less qubits on the chip? Yeah, that's a great question, thank you. Uh, so uh, there's good news there. So our tools are all scalable, first of all. So a lot of times you will see methods deployed and in implemented on a 10 qubit system, and they only work because it's a 10 qubit system. So all of our tools work in a scalable fashion. They can work on 1,000, a million qubits. So that's the first hurdle to that question, which is the tools actually do work efficiently looking forward into the NISC era. Um, the second point I would add is that we've seen evidence, and this was part of one of the papers from Lawrence Berkeley, showing that the amount of improvement we get improves with the complexity of the problem, and it improves as the hardware improves. So our tools work marginally well with the current error rates, well, marginally well, in the sense of we're getting these five Xs, these eight Xs, um, but we know that when the errors reduce, when we have systems coming out with 10 to the minus four error rates, the, the improvement factor we can achieve actually increases, and we're excited to work with our partners to show that experimentally in the, in the coming months. Follow-up question. Yes, just a quick follow-up on that. I was just wondering, are some of these tools open source that we can access and try it out as well, or it has to be a direct partnership with you guys? So they're licensable. So we have the softwares available. We have customers who are end users, customers who are hardware makers. Uh, we provide a license to the technology. We provide support and services as part of our as part of our full offering, including for academic kind of including. I'm sorry, academic licenses. Yeah, actually, we do have academic licenses as well, and we have many academic customers. Thanks for asking. Any more questions? Okay, with that, let's thank Joseph one more time. Thank you again.